everyone. So hope you're having a good, good day. And uh, so today I want to talk a little bit uh, about, before we get started into, last time we talked about continuous Fourier transforms, so CFTs. So we know that we use CFT when we know essentially the functional form of the equation. We know how to calculate our harmonic coefficients. This expression here, probably all know it by heart now. Y of t, cosine, u pi, n t, for period, dt. So, before we get into DFT, I want to talk uh, actually a little bit first about some really kind of interesting uh, and uh, very interesting concepts called spectral leakage and signal aliasing. So I'm going to write that down really quick now that we've kind of refreshed ourselves on what CFT is. So we want to talk about spectral leakage. Excuse me, let me erase that. Can't spell spectral leakage and signal aliasing. We're going to talk about signal aliasing first. It's a really kind of interesting concept and actually really important essentially in terms of your Fourier and especially your DFT analysis. So when we have a DFT analysis, uh, we are going to be working with uh, basically a, uh, calculating a discrete number of samples. So as you can kind of see in the image here, we have our original signal. We're not going to be able to get the functional form like we have for CFT. We're not going to know what is our Y of T. Instead, we're going to take points. So we don't know our functional form of y of t. Instead, we're going to grab points, as you see in the image here, right along this curve, and then we're going to analyze that. So take these points, and you can see that there's this regular spacing, this regular interval between the points that is delta t. So that is going to be essentially uh, basically the time spacing where we're going to grab points. Now. There's going to be a series of basically uh, equations that we really need to kind of start to memorize and, uh, and to work quickly uh, in terms of DFT analysis. So delta T is going to be one important parameter because if I ask you what is the frequency or the sampling frequency, the sampling frequency of your system is just going to be 1 over delta T. And if we're looking for the period, the period is just going to be N times delta T, where... N is your total number of samples. And we, le uh, we learned last time, we know from CFT, if I want to look at my F fundamental or my delta F, my lowest frequency, that is going to be 1 over T, which is also equivalent to 1 over N delta T. And we also know, again, that 1 over, uh, 1 over T is FS. So... We could rewrite this again as the sampling frequency fs over n. So again, lots of ways to kind of write and relate these. So just keep that in mind, uh, essentially when you're solving problems. Have these kind of on your sheet. Uh, basically know how to manipulate them. And, you know, if you're given some values, you can calculate uh, lots of other values in here depending on what you have here. So keep kind of all these expressions in mind. Have them on your sheet. Start to memorize them. Be comfortable working with it. So... We haven't talked, started talking about signal aliasing yet, but that's the basis of DFT. So we don't know the functional form. We don't know if this is 10x or whatever it is, but instead we're going to grab points uh, basically from our signal, and we're going to analyze essentially these points. So uh, now to the topic of basically signal aliasing. So one of the questions that you might have is, well, how do I know if I want to sample uh, a signal, how am I going to figure out what's the proper sampling frequency to use? Also, how do I figure out how many number of points I need to select in order to properly uh, basically sample my signal? So what's the issue with this plot right here? Well, what I'm seeing initially is that your delta t in this figure, delta t is too large. So it's too big. What's the issue if you choose a sampling frequency that is too, uh, basically, a delta t that's too large here? Well, you're missing some frequencies in your signal, right? You're not uh, basically hitting these high frequency values up here. So we're not able to kind of hit and properly sample uh, this signal. So if your delta T is too large, delta T, that's too large, you're going to miss high frequency signals. So FS too small, I'll turn, you know, again, you know, it's all this inverse relationship. So FS is small, we miss, again, these high frequency signals. 
The other problem with this uh, basically sampling is obviously, what else? We don't have a number of points. So our n is too small. If we don't sample enough, if we don't take enough, if n is small, we are going to miss also the low frequency signals. We are going to miss kind of these long periodic uh, signals in here because, again, we're not properly sampling. We're not hitting essentially all of these kind of different signals or these different uh, possible frequencies in your original signal. So if your N is too small, we are going to miss the low frequency signal. If your sampling frequency is too small, you're going to miss these high frequency signals. So ideally, we'd want a situation like this. And honestly, even we would obviously even want our N to be even larger so that we hit, you know, uh, this as well. But this is the basic idea here. We want to maximize, you know, in a perfect world, we would want, you know, Fs to be, you know, infinitely high. So infinite. And we'd want n to be infinite. Now, can we do this? No. Practically speaking, uh, when you're thinking about how do you, you know, analyze and how do you kind of take uh, basically a signal, we're going to use our data. You, you, you know, you'll typically use a data acquisition device. You know, we use the Vernier, um, uh, Vernier sensor DAC. But, I mean, you can use a National Instruments DAC. There's tons of data acquisition devices. Um, but, you know, even if you buy the best one, you're going to be limited in terms of how fast you can sample and the number of samples that you can take. And that's going to have a drastic uh, implication on uh, basically what signals that we could actually measure. Because we're going to run into this problem of basically here we're going to get into finally uh, <laughs> signal aliasing. So signal aliasing is basically this concept that um, if you improperly sample your signal, you're going to find basically an apparent frequency that is different from your original signal. And this is a huge issue, right? So again, I always use this example of kind of building bridges or whatever you're, you know. So if you improperly sample your signal, you might see, you know, you might obtain... Uh, basically a frequency spectrum and you might find oh well this is the dominant frequency but if you have this con if you have signal aliasing basically you're measuring an incorrect frequency so this frequency doesn't really exist it's just a result um, from your improper sampling so we're gonna see that actually right now so you have to be really really careful when you actually analyze your data and make sure and see what's the largest frequencies that you could actually measure in your sample so we're gonna actually uh, there's a very special name for that frequency uh, we're going to actually kind of show that right here. So, if I were to properly uh, analyze my signal, we have this kind of really nice uh, set of figures here that kind of shows our example. So, I choose, and it's hard to see, but you could zoom in on the notes. Uh, again, uh, post it on uh, Canvas, and again, if you need some more, please let me know. Uh, so, if I sample at the same frequency as my signal, what is the apparent frequency here? So, if I sample here, 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 where my FS... Here in this problem, the fs is equal to f. What is the apparent frequency of my signal? It's zero, right? The apparent signal, the apparent frequency, or f apparent, is equal to zero hertz. That's obviously this exact. This we have aliased our signal. We are not sampling high enough, so we are measuring a frequency that does not that doesn't capture the real frequency of our signal. Uh, hopefully, that makes sense. Let's increase a little bit more. So let's have this region where we're f is basically greater than fs, so f, our, our free, sampling frequency is greater than f, but it is still less than 2f. Well, you see it gets a little bit better, but again, it's not, we're not hitting essentially, you know, we're still biasing our signal. We don't, we're not hitting, it's not showing the same frequency. This frequency is still, our f apparent is less than fs. We are still biasing our signal. Excuse me for the you know, horrible handwriting. Now, what happens if I set my sampling frequency equal to twice my signal frequency? Well, you can see here, the apparent frequency seems to be pretty much in line, right? With the frequency that we're actually measuring. Well, this seems pretty good. So that's our rule, right? So our, our, if our sampling frequency is at least twice our frequency, we're good. Well, the problem with sines and cosines and sinusoidal, again, DFT, CFT, we're all approximating our uh, original signal as this kind of infinite series of sines and cosines. The problem with that is if we phase shift, 
If we introduce a phase lag, which is done here, so if we introduce a phase lag of 90 degrees, now what is my apparent signal? Zero, 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 zero. So our F apparent is back to the zero hertz scenario. So in order to actually properly sample my signal, I need to make sure that my sampling frequency is greater than two hertz. Or uh, sorry, not two hertz. Uh, <laughs> greater than twice my original sample, uh, my original frequency. So that introduces a really, really kind of important. I'm going to switch to kind of our lecture notes here in just a second. Uh, going back to aliasing and spectral leakage. So again, this is just giving us our nice kind of definitions of sampling rate, total number of points recorded. Uh, and again, this is just highlighting what we talked about previously. Total time period is too short. Low frequencies can be missed. Sampling rate's not uh, too low. Delta T is large. High frequencies will not be re resolved. So same thing that we've kind of just talked about previously. Uh, but same thing uh, <laughs> in this graph as well. So there's a limit, basically, uh, depending on our FS. So once we select an FS, a sampling frequency, there is a limit uh, in terms of the highest frequency that we could measure. And that is given exactly by what we just talked about before. We need to make sure our FS is at least uh, twice as great as our original signal. But alternatively, we could also say that uh, the highest frequency that we can resolve is a special frequency called the Nyquist frequency. So our F Nyquist is going to be FS over 2. Or, as you can see here, from 2 delta T. So, my Nyquist frequency is the highest frequency that I can resolve once I select a sampling frequency. I can't resolve any frequency higher than that because otherwise I'll get spectral, I'll get uh, basically signal aliasing. So just like we've kind of uh, talked about previously. So we need to make sure that uh, we, we, once we choose that sampling frequency, sampling fr signals with lower than Nyquist frequency are actively sampled. Greater than, we're going to have basically this signal aliasing. So this is uh, kind of a really actually a huge finding that we have in this course. Uh, so we want to make sure that we kind of really highlight this. And again, you can't trust, you know, someone, you know, gives you this, you know, again, this CF or this frequency spectrum plot with C of N and all these, you know, delta Fs to N over 2 delta F. You cannot trust, you know, again, you really need to kind of see, okay, what was the sampling rate? Are they, are, are they really not biasing their signal? What frequencies are they trying to measure? So you want to make sure that there's no signal aliasing uh, in your sample. So that takes care of signal aliasing. Now, spectral leakage uh, is another matter. So we will talk about uh, in the next video actually how to perform a Fourier transform, but we already know from uh, your CFT Fourier transform that we plot a uh, frequency spectrum in terms of in inter uh, integral values of delta F. And you're going to see in the next video that, again, we can only plot up to the limit of, you know, N over 2 times delta F. Uh, we're going to show that and prove that uh, in just a bit, but uh, kind of stay with us for now, uh, and we'll kind of show why that uh, actually is the case. So, and actually we'll prove that, we will definitely prove that next time. Uh, so, now the concept of spectral leakage is another thing that we have to be careful of uh, when we're actually analyzing this frequency spectrum. Spectral leakage. So for spectral leakage, really, let's say I want to measure, uh, let's say I'm trying to measure a, um, a signal that has a frequency of 10.17 hertz. So I know that my resonant frequency falls in here. It's exactly that value. But I chose uh, a delta F that was basically had a value of 1 hertz. So my lowest frequency was 1 hertz. Well, I know that it's gonna, I'm gonna plot one hertz here, and then interval, this will be two hertz, three hertz, et cetera, right? I can only plot my resolution, my frequency resolution is one hertz. It is this delta F. So am I gonna be able to measure this accurately? No. What's gonna happen is I'm gonna have, uh, let me erase this, kind of make some magic here. I'm gonna have, once I hit, I'm going to kind of magically go to, <laughs> uh, I'm going to magically go to uh, 10 hertz. So I have, let's say, this is my, uh, here's my sample at 9 hertz. 
or by frequency, excuse me. Here's 10 hertz, and here is 11 hertz. The 10.17 is going to be mixed. Uh, basically, we're not going to be able to measure that frequency here. So this contribution, whatever that frequency is, at, or whatever the contribution to the uh, harmonic coefficients, it's going to be split. It's going to leak into this frequency, and it's going to leak into this frequency. Now, this is a dangerous, uh, again, kind of scenario when you're talking about in terms of engineering, right? Because when we talk about dominant frequency, we're going to say, okay, well, this is 10 hertz. But who's, who's to really know, is, that being, is this really the dominant frequency, or is there spectral leakage going on from some contribution at 9.8, for example, or 10.17, or you know, uh, you know, 10.5? We're not sure. So you have to make sure, you know, when you're trying to analyze your signal, you want to pick, again, as high a sampling frequency as possible and as large a number of points as possible because that is going to, your delta F depends on exactly that, Fs over N, right? So we need to make sure that that is the exact, you know, that we're working with this situation here. So if we want, we want delta F to be as small as possible, so we need to make sure that, uh, you know, your sampling frequency is high enough to avoid aliasing, but we need our number of points. That's really going to shrink, essentially, our resolution. So we need to make sure that the number of points is as large as possible. But, again, the sampling frequency has to make sure that there's no uh, aliasing. So it's this mix of we have to make sure there's no signal aliasing, but we want to make sure that our frequency resolution is as low as possible so we could pick up uh, kind of as many frequency contributions uh, that we can so we could avoid this concept of spectral leakage. So... Uh, yeah, I hope that uh, helps. Uh, that was kind of a really briefly, in a nutshell, uh, kind of spectral leakage uh, for your kind of discrete Fourier for transform and also uh, signal aliasing. Um, so again, yeah, I hope that helps. Uh, and yeah, next time we're going to kind of show um, the long derivation of how do we actually calculate a discrete Fourier transform. So we're going to move from CFT where we had those uh, basically integrals. We're going to transform them into uh, kind of summation, and then we're going to work uh, basically throughout uh, with that. So uh, real quickly before we leave, let's actually uh, want to take a little bit of time to introduce that little derivation uh, and show how that N over 2 is actually your Nyquist frequency. So let's take a little bit of a peek in here and play around with this. So when we plot our frequency spectrum, C of n for our DFT, again, we'll have the zero value, then it'll be delta F, and our last point here will be n over 2 times delta F. So let's break this down a little bit. Excuse my horrible handwriting. You all know that's why I have LaTeX right over here. That's what I'm trying to draw there. So we know that delta F is equal to what? Our Fs over n, correct? Uh, we've kind of shown that previously uh, in this lecture, so remember, actually, it's you know it's really good to write these out as many times as possible. So we know that our period is going to be n times delta t. We know that uh, our sampling frequency is 1 over delta t. So if we flip that, we know our delta f is always 1 over t. That is equal to 1 over n delta t, which is equal to this parameter right here. So... We can only, we just kind of talked about for signal aliasing, once you select an FS, the largest frequency that we could actually measure is your Nyquist frequency. So, excuse me, F Nyquist. And that is going to be your FS over 2. Half of your sampling frequency. So, we only plot to N over 2 delta F because of just that factor, right? So, if I substitute in N FS over 2 because N... I'm just substituting in for delta F, you see that we're just plotting to that Nyquist frequency because Fs over 2 is our Nyquist frequency. So that was a quick derivation. We'll kind of see it last time, uh, next time. It's actually really cool because actually if you calculate it out, you'll see that if you go beyond the Nyquist frequency, it's just a mirror image. So you're not really uh, measuring any new or novel frequency. It's just this kind of mirror reflection. Um, so that's a really cool kind of finding uh, you'll see in the mathematics notebook. So uh, excited for next time. So stay safe out there. Again, if you need any more kind of, uh, we went through this pretty quickly. If you want some examples, there's going to be a lot in the problem set that you'll work with. Uh, a lot will come on the exam. So let me know and I'd be happy to provide some more for you. And um, yeah, uh, that's great. Uh, so oh, actually, sorry, one more, one more scenario. Uh, there's a, a kind of a, a quick way to kind of measure the apparent frequency here. 
uh, an important example that we have in class. So actually, let's look at this example before we leave. Uh, start, sorry, I ended a little bit early. So in this sign signal, what is our highest frequency here that we need to resolve? Well, it's just 200 pi, right? So is f equal to 200 pi or 2000 pi, excuse me? No, this in here is omega. Omega equals 2000 pi, Why I'm saying 200. Uh, so again, I'm always interested in f. We know that omega equals two pi f. So if I wanna solve for f, plugging that in, f is gonna be 1000 hertz. So in this example, I sample, so remember our frequency of our signal was 1000 hertz. I sample at 1500 hertz, or uh, yeah, 1500 hertz, and I take 100 points. So am I gonna have signal aliasing? Yes, because I need to make sure Fs is greater than twice F. 1500 is not greater than twice our original signal. But we're gonna have signal aliasing. So we could kind of prove that here, right? So look at where this repeats. So up, down, up. What is our period here? And then down again, and then up again, and then down again, and then down again. You know, exactly. You, you can kind of see the picture here. What is our period here? Well, we could see the period is this, right? It is our period T is going to be 0 0.002 seconds. So if I flip that, I know that my frequency is going to be the lowest. The delta F is going to be 1 over my period. That is going to be what? It's not going to be <laughs> 1,000 hertz. So again, we're measuring this signal that is not uh, essentially the same as our original signal. That is kind of the key you know, fact of, or the key finding of an apparent frequency that is not the same as your apparent uh, signal. So what you'll find uh, in, this, you know, in this problem is that you'll see that the apparent frequency is different from your initial frequency. So actually, if you plug that in, it's going to be 500 hertz. So again, we've aliased our signal. We're measuring a frequency that's not there, that's not a representative of the true signal frequency. Um, so I would say go back, go through this problem, and now if you sample at a sampling frequency of 3,000 hertz, what is the apparent frequency? I will tell you already that it will actually be 1,000 hertz, and you've sampled this properly, but prove that to yourself. The other thing you could say uh, that you could kind of find out just from looking at this point, or looking at this problem, we know that our FS here was 1500 hertz. We also know that the total number of points was 1000. We could figure out our delta F just from, uh, or the, the delta F of your you know, function by looking at your FS over here. Uh, again, we can look at that a little bit later uh, and you can kind of show that, but this is our kind of apparent frequency here. So. But again, you want to start identifying these problems and seeing, okay, what are you given? Start to kind of label this. We know this already is n equals 1,000. We know this is fs. So start to identify this problem and then figure out how to, you know, work through these. So, yep. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, and, yes, I'll be help, uh, happy to help you out. Again, if you want more worked examples, um, just let me know, and I'll be happy to do so. Thanks. Again, now have a safe one, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, I'll see you uh, next video. Thanks.